all right welcome to another video this is a rare late 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 night video i'm gonna be continuing to read this python devops book beginning with the execution control section python has many constructs to control the flow of statement execution you can group statements you wish to run together as a block of code these blocks can be run multiple times using for and while loops or only run under certain conditions using if statements while loops or try except blocks using these constructs is the first step to taking advantage of the power of programming different languages demarcate blocks of code using different conventions many languages with syntax similar to the c language a very influential language used in writing Unix. Use curly brackets around a group of statements to define a block. In Python, indentation is used to indicate a block. Statements are grouped by indentation into blocks that execute as a unit. Note, the Python interpreter does not care if you use tabs or spaces to indent as long as you are consistent the python style guide pep pep 8 however recommends using four white spaces for each level of indentation if elif else um oh and one thing i'd like to say um that isn't in this group is um you might think, oh, well, I'm not going to use four spaces. You know, why would I hit the space bar four times if I can just hit the tab once? So in a lot of editors, um, this is set up by default. But if yours is not, um, most editors will allow you to change the tab key to automatically just um, be the equivalent of hitting the four space four times with the push of one button, the tab button. So that is what I recommend. I recommend using the, the tab key, but making sure that when you use the tab key is the equivalent of hitting the space bar four times. Okay, next section is if elif else, if elis elf else statements, I call them conditionals, are common ways to branch between decisions in code. A block directly after an if statement runs if that statement evaluates to true. So here we have some statements that evaluate to true. Here we use the equal equal operator, which returns true if items are equal and false if not. Optionally, this block can allow an if or else statement with an accompanying block in the case of an elif statement this block only executes if the elif evaluates true see an example of that multiple elif loops can append together if you are familiar with switch statements in other languages, this stimulates the same behavior of choosing from multiple choices. Adding an else statement at the end runs a block if none of the other conditionals evaluates the true. So this is kind of one of the main things you'll see um, in uh, programming is this set of I call uh, what I like to call uh, conditionals because um, they check for conditions and then they run it if true. Um, one thing that's kind of missing from this explanation, which I don't think technically has to be there because if you're if you're learning it new, um, it's, it's just confusing and, it, and to be honest, it's, it's not even that relevant. Um, but um, hopefully this book is not for new learners. I'm, I'm not really sure what this section is intended for, but um, one thing I would like to 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 point out is here we have uh, one. So does one equal one like this? 
So the answer is false because uh, here we have uh, one as a type int and here we have one as a type str. So they're not equal to one another even though they're technically the same thing. Um, now where it gets even trickier is let's say we have um, a equaling this value. So now it can get tricky because this value does equal um, a. So um, yeah, it's it's of course always important to to know what your variables are intended to be. Um, and to make sure that that your your code is behaving in ways you expect that can be very very uh, difficult that's that's kind of the crux of the issue so yeah your your st if statements uh, simply evaluate to simply run on anything that evaluates the boolean true um, so any string evaluates the boolean true um, you can see if I use this boolean I can get a, uh, a value for it. So here we have an empty list. Let's see what the Boolean value is for that. Um, oh, it's actually B-O-O-L. Okay, so that value is to false. Let's put something, let's put uh, three values in that list. And now we've got true. Let's have a, an empty string. That's false. Let's put some values in that string. That's true. So that can be really helpful. Um, for example, you can have the, the RE module and you can say if re.search and then let's say one, two, three and then the search string, you can have it be a variable um, but the variable could be uh, the host name. So, so let's say my router one, two, three Um, print okay so this is the router we're looking for because we found this uh, regex here um, in, in the host name so router 122 router 124 uh, would not be um, one of the routers uh, you're looking for there. Um, now if it gets crazy you've got thousands of routers um, this will have a false match if you had router uh, 1230 through 1239 um, you would get uh, a false you get a false positive for all of those so this is this is probably one of the most commonly used aspects of, of code that you'll see time and time again but unfortunately it is also probably one of the more difficult aspects to make sure you're you're getting right and and definitely to get right on on the first time without lots of experimentation and confirmation that things are working the way you expect them to you can test if statements creating blocks containing if statements that only execute if an outer if statement is true. Yeah, and this is the kind of thing you'll see a lot. Uh, ifs nested in ifs. Um, so you can see here's our first uh, statement. Uh, yep, we've got s in cat. Um, so the string s is belongs to the uh, string saved into the variable cat. So now that, that we know that is true, um, we can do another check um, to see if it equals this. It doesn't, now we're gonna print some other cat and then we're gonna be done. We won't execute this last else statement because this first if statement evaluated to boolean true, s was in cat. If this evaluated to boolean false, then we would trigger this and we wouldn't run any of this code here. 
All right, for loops. For loops allow you to repeat a block of statements, a code block, once for each member of a sequence ordered group of items. As you iterate through the sequence, the current item can be accessed by the code block. One of the most common uses of loops is to iterate through a range object to do a test of to do a task a set number of times. Okay, so this is the other big thing you'll see in in code and this is one of the things a lot of this is probably more what what users struggle with new new learners to to code struggle with is these loops um, especially the difference between a, a while loop and a for loop I have found that for loops are much more frequently used than while loops uh, just in my own code um, but both are, are just absolute fundamental uh, concepts that must be matter, mastered regardless of the language you're you're working on. These are these sorts of things are going to be present in every language. It's just the specific uh, things you need to type are going to vary from language to language, but the actual things are are shared across languages. It's kind of like whether you're speaking Spanish, English, Japanese you still have grammar, you still have, um, you know, verbs and nouns and adjectives, you still have past tense, present tense. Those are universal concepts regardless of the language. Um, same thing with code, you still have while loops, you still have for loops, you still have conditionals, and much, much more depend independent of the kind of code that you use. In this example, our block of code is as follows. We repeat this code 10 times, each time assigning the variable i to the next number in the sequence of integers from 0 through 9. For loops can be used to iterate through any of the Python sequence types. You will see these later in this chapter. Continue. The continue statement skips a step in the loop jumping to the next item in the sequence um, yep so we can see we can use a continue statement to skip three we've got zero one two and then we skipped three and went to four that's because we have this extra conditional here so as we're going through this uh, here we're going to go th zero through five because that's what this range command does it uh, creates a range of numbers up to, but not including, the specified number given to that function here, uh, in this case 6. And then for each value in that, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, it will be stored in this variable i. So one thing you need to learn when you're coding is to imagine this uh, variable um, in, in different sequences. So um, kind of a way you could you could rewrite that code. Um, but of course you would you wouldn't want to do this, but to kind of learn what the power is of for loops, um, you can write the code like this. So we can say, um, uh, I is going to equal zero, and then we, we can do uh, print I, um, and then we're going to do I equals one, print I, I equals two, print I. And now we'll do our, our special conditional here. So before that, we're going to define i, i equals 3. And then we'll have our, our conditional. If i equals 3, and we know it does, we just did that. We're going to, now we're not going to do uh, continue because we're not in a for loop. But what we are going to do is, is uh, do nothing. So we'll use this word pass here. 
Okay, so we did nothing, so let's go on to the next one. I equals 4. Okay, and now we're going to print I. And then finally, I equals 5. Print I. So this is the exact same code that we see here. It's just written out uh, step by step, and you can see it's multiple lines to run. Uh, very inconvenient to run, very, very tricky to go, and, and notice that, hey, you know, I had a special condition for three. It's hard to see that because it's buried amongst the other code, but it's definitely a, a perfectly valid way to get the similar results, to, to get the same results that you can get using a for loop. Um, the problem is once you have a for loop, let's say leaping, looping through a thousand or a million um, different variables, um, each uh, named I during the iteration it is on, writing it out this way will just take you far too long and it'll be far too unruly to um, to review later on. So uh, I'm going to show you how to do this exact same thing except uh, using the range function and a for loop. So the equivalent code for this that we see on the left is for i in range and then we've got to use six even though we end with five here because range is up to but not including the number specified okay and now we can put our conditional there and remember in order for your code to be run together you've got to include white space here so python knows the code underneath this for loop applies to each iteration in the for loop. Okay, so if i equals 3, so I could put pass here as well, it, it would do the same thing um, pretty much, but I'm going to use the continue uh, word. It's basically doing the same thing as, as pass, but if I were to use pass instead of continue, it would run the rest of the code. So if I ran this same thing, but I used pass instead of continue on this line here, it would get printed out because it would do nothing here, and then it would go on to the next line in the code. Since I used continue, if this conditional evaluates to Boolean true, it will continue on with the for loop and move to the next iteration without running the rest of the code here. All right, so let's see that happen. And there we go. We can see just how much a for loop can do, just how much more powerful it is when compared to the alternative we see here. We've got one, two, three, four, lines of code to do the same thing that that took us um, let's see here okay so without the the for loop uh, we had to use 14 lines of code took us down to to four and not only that, it, it looks a lot neater, all of our conditionals are easier to read, and it's just possible to keep straight what we're doing when we write it this way, as opposed to writing it this way. Okay, next section is while loops. While loops repeat a block as long as a condition evaluates to true. So this is another one that I use all the time can see we're defining an initial count to zero and this is one that's a little bit trickier than for loops because you've got to remember to increment your index so if we define this to zero and then we say while well, count is less than three 
if we don't include this line down here, it will stay zero and the count will never increment. So this will always be Boolean true. And when that happens, this is an infinite while loop. It will keep looping through and your computer will freeze up and it will just cause you a big problem. A lot of the times when an application or your browser freezes up and you can't do anything, it's because there was a while loop that didn't have some sort of index that would eventually cause the conditional to evaluate to Boolean false. So that's a big thing. It's hard for beginners to uh, pick up, I think, and it, it, it's a big source of, of frustration, I think, as well, because if you get your learning environment locked up and you, and you can't get to it, that can be a really frustrating experience. So while loops are a bit more tricky than for loops, but really as long as you remember to define and increment your indexes, they're really, really easy. It is essential to define a way for your loop to end. Otherwise you will be stuck in a loop in the loop until your program crashes. One way to handle this is to define your conditional statement such that it eventually evaluates to false. An alternative pattern uses the break statement to loop statement to exit a loop using a nested conditional. So you can see here we've got our index defined, we're calling it count, and then while true we're going to be printing the count. So here we can see one, two, three, but if the count is greater than five, we're going to stop the program. So you can see, oops, it's greater than five, but it printed it out. That's weird. I thought, I thought we were going to stop it if it, if it was greater than five. Well, what happens is when the count goes to five, yes, it is greater. So, so let's, let's think about what happens when the count is five. So the count is five, this while true statement, uh, goes the the while loop evaluated to boolean true because that's just the value we gave it boolean true the next thing that's going to happen is it's going to print out the counts so this is count five we see that happen here after that it's going to do another uh, check another conditional so if this evaluates to boolean true we'll be running the code here if it evaluates to boolean false We'll be skipping this line and running the value here. So is five greater than five? No, that will evaluate to Boolean false. Five is equal to five. So we will be running this. We won't be running this line here. So now our count has been incremented by one. So it's going to be six. But here's where it gets interesting. What happens next is we go back to the top of the while loop. We start here, we evaluate the conditional. The conditional is just given as Boolean true, so it passes the conditional. The conditional does evaluate to Boolean true. That's in fact the value we gave it. Then the next thing it does is run the next line. So here it is. It ran the next line. The count is six, even though this conditional will evaluate to Boolean true and the loop will end there. Because it incremented at the end of the last iteration, it still prints out the code above the code here that would cause the break because the lines in the while statement that we know belong to the while statement because of these spaces here, these white spaces, are one run in order one by one. So we start with the conditional, making sure that is true. Otherwise, we just stop running it. We don't iterate to the next uh, iteration. 
then we print here regardless of, of what happens next because it happens in order. This is the next line in order. But after that, we look at the conditional here and we assess whether this is Boolean false or Boolean true. 6 is greater than 5, so this is Boolean true, so we break. We do not print the count is 7 because we never increment the count. And, if, and, and this is one I would like to go ahead and run because I just want to prove that if we were to print out count after this, we wouldn't see the count go to seven, even though we have this code down here, because it'll hit this break and that stops the loop. So the next line of code will not execute, will not run because we stopped running the code before we got to that line. Okay, so see we got the same results they got up there, but if we were to look at what the count variable is set up, um, it will be set, and let's do a three, two, one, make sure you're on board with me. Will it be set, here, here's the question, will it be set to six or will it be set to seven? it's going to be set to six because when we hit this conditional, it does evaluate to Boolean true because six is bigger than five. So it does execute this statement here that is tied to this because it's indented underneath it. And the break statement means it immediately ends going through the while loop and does not execute any further code within the while loop. Next section is handling exceptions. Exceptions are a type of error causing your program to crash if not handled or caught. Catching them with a try except block allows the program to continue. These blocks are created by indenting the block in which the exception might be raised. Putting a try statement before it and an accept statement after it, followed by a code block that should run when the error occurs. There are many built-in exceptions, such as IO error, key error, and import error. Many third-party packages also define their own exception errors. They indicate that something has gone very wrong so it only pays to catch them if you are confident that the problem won't be fatal to your software. You can specify explicitly which exception type you will catch. Ideally, you should catch the exact exception type. In our example, this was the exception index error. So you can actually use broken code to accomplish your aims as long as you use try accept blocks. So a good example of this is if I define a list named example and then we'll say it equals a list with the integers one, two, and three. And let's say I want to find a value at index zero, one, two, three. So let's see what is at index three. Okay, so we can see we have an index error, list index out of range. The index three does not exist at all. It's not that there is an index three, but there's just no value in index three. The problem is that there is no index three. So what we can do is wrap this in a try except statement. So we're gonna do try 
example. And we'll see what's at index three. But if there's nothing at index three, we know we're going to get the error code. And the error code is going to be index error. So we can write accept and then include the error code. Another thing we could do is just write accept and move on and run this code no matter the error code. But that's considered bad practice because there could be a case where an error happens that you didn't expect to happen and the code will run in a scenario that you did not expect the code to run. Generally, the best thing to do is have code fail to run if it were instead to run in a situation that you not, did not expect. If you don't design your projects that way, you could have code running that is destructive and causes harm to the computer because it runs in a situation you did not intend for it to run. Okay, so let's see what happens if I include the code print. We'll do hello world underneath this. So you can see now instead of getting this index error, we tried this and it did not evaluate it, it, it did not uh, work so we'll go to this accept statement now and we'll print hello world so here's an interesting thing to know and this I think is crucial for anyone learning about try accept blocks let's say if I were to go try and now we're going to say one equals two so this is not true, right? It's a Boolean false statement, right? So this is going to trigger the accept block, right? Let's see what happens. Okay, so if we're understanding try accept statements correctly, what will happen is it will try the code that belongs to the try statement, which we can see from this white space is this statement here, one equals two, but since one does not equal two and it evaluates to Boolean false, we're going to trigger the accept statement and print out this message that says failed. Is that right? No, that is wrong. In fact, what we can see is instead of printing this message, it printed out the results of this evaluation here to determine whether this statement is Boolean true or Boolean false. So the key takeaway from this is to understand that try statements, try accept statements are not working in the same way as if statements where they evaluate whether a condition is Boolean true or Boolean false. What they're evaluating is if a condition can be recognized by Python and run as valid code. If it can, it will pass the try statement and run the code underneath the try statement. The try statement will be successful. There will not be an exception and there will not be an error code even if the code evaluates to boolean false it still successfully ran the code and came up with a result the result being boolean false however if python fails to understand the code and cannot run it as we see happened up here it could not understand my specification of index 3 because this data type here being a list only had indexes of 0, 1, and 2. So Python failed to run the code and it did so because of this index error. So in that case the accept statement is 
triggered because Python failed to run the code underneath the try statement. In this case, where Python did succeed to run the code, however the result was boolean false, the accept statement is not triggered because Python successfully ran the code even though the ultimate result of the code was boolean false. Try accept statements do not work the same way as conditional if, elif, else statements. They are not checking for the same things. The if statements are checking whether a statement is boolean true or boolean false, but a try except block is checking whether code within the try portion of the code block is able to be run by Python without an error. If it is able to be run, the code under the try portion will be run and nothing else will happen. If it is not able to be run, the code under the accept statement will be run. Another really important thing to understand about try accept statements is that if a code piece of code within a line of code within the try portion is not able to be run by Python due to some sort of erroneous condition, a condition that has an error, such as the index error, the accept statement will be triggered on that line. So if I were to go try and we're going to do print hello world and then we're going to go next we're going to try to um, in the example we still got this example variable defined um, so we're going to try the same thing again that here triggered an index error. So we're going to be triggering an index error again the same way we did before. Okay, so my question is, what will this code do? And I'll give you three seconds. Three, two, one. Okay, so what the code is going to do is try to run all of these lines that are tied to the try statement with this white space. And if Python is unable to run, not whether they evaluate to Boolean true or false, that's only the case for conditional statements, L, else, if, elif, and elf, for example, if, elif, and else, for example, is, is where it will evaluate the statements to Boolean true or false and take an action based on the results of that. But try works differently. It simply attempts to run the line, and if the line, line runs successfully, it will uh, not to do anything except go to the next line in the try statement. But if the line does not run successfully, and there's a Python error, Python was not able to run the line, regardless of what the line would have done if it were able to be run, then the accept block is triggered. So when I hit enter, I will get this statement because even though there is a part of the try block that will return a Python error, the index error, and therefore cannot be processed by Python, it goes through one line at a time and the first line will succeed. So therefore it will print out. And there we go. This is what we saw happen. The first line didn't have any problems being run by Python. So it will go to the next line, which did have problems. So now the accept statement will trigger 
and we will see this print failed message as well. Okay, next section is built-in objects. In this overview, we will not be covering OOP, which stands for Object Oriented Programming. The Python language, however, comes with quite a few built-in classes. What is an object? In OOP, Object Oriented Programming, data or state and functionality appear together. The essential concepts to understand when working with objects are class instantiating, instantiation, creating objects from classes, and dot syntax, the syntax for accessing an object's attributes and methods. A class defines attributes and methods shared by its objects. Think of it as the technical drawing of a car model. The class can then be instantiated to create an instance. The instance or object is a single car built based on those drawings. Okay, so here we, we're creating a, a class. Then we uh, yeah, so we can see it is a, a class type. So we instantiate it, we get my car, and now we can see that the type is still a class as it was before, but it's an instantiation of the class, so um, we get more information. You don't need to worry about creating your own classes at this point. Just understand that each object is an instantiation of a class. Object methods and attributes. Objects store data in attributes. These attributes are variables attached to the object or object class. Objects define functionality in object methods. Methods defined for all objects in a class. And class methods, methods attached to a class and shared by all objects in the class, which are functions attached to the object. Note. In Python documentation, functions attached to objects and classes are referred to as methods. These functions have access to the object's attributes and can modify and use the object's data. To call an object's method or access one of its attributes, we use dot syntax. Okay, so here we have a, a class um, given it wheels. We're defining a, a method, um, which is kind of like a function, but it's a function that is a property of a class. And we instantiate the class using the my car variable, and now we can access the uh, defined variables in the class using this dot notation. So the way I like to think about classes is, um, let's say. It is as if as if it were a file, uh, another file. So another way to write um, this class would be uh, like this. Let's say we have one file here, and we're just going to call this my file, and then we'll just do this all in one area of my computer here, the Notepad plus plus file here. So we're gonna, uh, yeah. So this is called my file. So within this, um, we would have um, any variable that's that's just here. So we have my car equals fancy car, you know, anything like that. But what a class would be is its own file. That's the way I like to think of, of classes. Is is basically like putting something in another file, but you can you include it in in a single file, and you get all the advantages of it being in a, in another file. All the variable names you use are unique to this class. So if I were to define a class um, using this uh, wheels, um, which I will do in my Python terminal here. 
So class, fancy car, wheels equal four, and then def drive fast, self print driving so fast. Okay, so now we have a class defined. So let's see this variable, wheels. Now this will print out a four, right? Because clearly we have defined wheels to equal four right here. Three, two, one. What's going to happen when I run this code? Okay, so we get a name error. Wheels is not defined. And that's because although we defined it in the class, this variable name is unique to this class. So I have not defined it anywhere except in this class. So now if I were to instantiate the class, I get a variable here that is an actual class. So this is basically like a file that has all of this code within it. So now I can access the wheels variable using a dot. In addition, I can access this function using a dot as well. Okay, and you can see I had to feed it a uh, variable. Um, this is where it gets confusing, this self. Um, hopefully the book will have a good explanation for that. So here our fancy car class defines a method called drive fast and an attribute wheels. When you instantiate a, an instance of fancy car named my car, you can access the attribute and invoke the method using the dot syntax. Sequences. Sequences are a family of built-in types, including the list, tuple, range, string, and binary types. Sequences represent ordered and finite collections of items. Sequence operations. There are many operations that work across all of the types of sequences, we cover some of the most commonly used operations here. Okay, so I think this is going to be it for me, unfortunately. Oh, actually, it's a 40, 47 minute video. That's a lot longer than I thought I'd be able to do tonight. I thought I could do like 20 minutes tops. So this was a really productive, uh, good video. Let me make sure I've only got one bookmark here. Okay, and I do. Perfect. So when I come back to this book, we'll be starting uh, here, which is part of the sequence operations section. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.